it's a fantastic to have you here, Charlotte. Um, Charlotte studied at the University of Manchester, uh, PhD from there, and then she's joined us here in the museum. I first met you actually on the on the uh, media training course together, and that's why I got the complete lowdown on the top secret Sophie project six months before anybody else did, because we happened to be on the same media training. So I was like, wow, that sounds absolutely fantastic, and what an amazing specimen we've got. So hopefully we'll hear a little bit more about the specimen and about the science behind it and, and the project as well. So over to you. We've got uh, forward back on that one. Thank you very much. Uh, okay, so today I'm going to talk to you about our latest acquisition. This is Sophie the Stegosaur. Uh, so my talk is kind of split into two, really. Uh, towards the end, I'll talk more about the actual science that's still very much ongoing at the moment. Uh, but to begin with, I'll talk more about the kind of techniques I've used uh, in imaging our specimen. So probably most of the interactions I've had with you guys, with scientists and curators, people seem to be more interested in the gadgets and the software that I'm using in imaging than actually Sophie the Stegosaur, which is fair enough. Uh, I appreciate that Perhaps not all of you in this room are, are dinosaur nuts, but I think everyone can appreciate what 3D imaging might bring to your projects and to your specimens. So I'll talk about that a bit first. Uh, so first of all, uh, I think everyone appreciates that digitization is a big priority for the museum. Uh, I think before I got here, I didn't quite understand the extent of the undertaking in digitizing the, the collection of the NHM. Uh, um, the kind of digitization that we've been doing on Sophie is, is 3D uh, and it's fairly um, labor intensive. Uh, it takes a long time and it takes some specialist bits of equipment mostly. Uh, and I appreciate that Sophie is going to be, uh, for the time being, the exception rather than the rule in the amount of, of 3D work that we've done on her. Uh, but hopefully I will convince you in this that when we have these exceptional specimens, when you're going to be doing a lot of research on them, or perhaps when they're part of an exhibit, or when you're loaning them out, perhaps this, the 3D visualisation is, is something that's worthwhile doing. Um, so the end product, what we're working towards is this. This is one of our computer models of Sophie the Stegosaur. Uh, this is in a piece of software for uh, forward dynamic modelling of locomotion, which is something that I'll talk a little bit about later. But this is the end product, uh, and how do we get there? Um, and first of all, we're going to talk a little bit about why I think it's worthwhile that we actually do some 3D scanning. Um, so uh, when we first started out, the reason for us doing it is, is pretty much the science output. Um, my background is in biomechanics and musculoskeletal modeling, and almost all the work that I do involves computer simulations, and I, I need these 3D models. Um, but actually, along the way, we found out a whole load of other reasons why having these 3D, 3D models is actually really useful. Uh, one of them is in conservation. So when you've got uh, clumsy paleontologists like me working on these specimens every day, uh, taking lots of photos of them, handling them for various reasons, putting them on and off the armature to test things, um, accidents happen, damage can occur, uh, and then it's a conservation unit that have, to, that have to pick those things up and fix them. So having these 3D models from the beginning is a really good archive, it's a really good backup for having them. Uh, and worst case scenario, when we put these things out on display, things get damaged or things go missing. Uh, so it's nice to have those 3D scans there before she goes out on display. Uh, this is Laura Fox, who was one of the conservators who we brought on uh, part-time. It was her entire job to go through the skeleton bone by bone and pick out little bits of plastic that had gotten in all the nooks and crannies of the skeleton uh, from the moulding and casting process, because uh, people have made copies of these. Uh, which brings us on to this. Um, so this is a new ceratopsian that's just gone on display at the Royal Ontario Museum uh, and this is entirely 3D printed. So this hasn't been cast and mold, this is uh, 3D printed from laser scans. Uh, as far as I'm aware, this is probably the biggest 3D print of a dinosaur in a public museum so far. Um, and this gets around all the problems of having to, to cast off of, of, of very you know, uh, precious fossils. Uh, it also means that you then don't have to store all of the, the moulds in, in, your, in your storage. Uh, and it also means that if you want to send your files elsewhere to get 3D printed in a different country, a different continent, you can just email them. Um, and I think this is probably, possibly, the future of how um, these reconstructions are going to go. Uh, it's also helped us a lot in... Whoops in exhibit design. Um, so hopefully you agree that uh, Sophie looks nice where she is now. 
uh, but actually fitting her into that space was quite a tight squeeze in terms of the size of her and making sure little kiddies couldn't reach her without having enough space for people to flow around her and not having a traffic jam. Uh, it's actually a really tight space to get her into. Uh, and the designer had uh, quite a hard time uh, designing something that looked you know, aesthetically pleasing, uh, but also within the kind of the confines of that space. So actually, while she was you know, CAD designing um, this stand, she was also had a 3D model of Sophie the Stegosaur and of the armature as well. So everything is custom built around that specimen. Uh, also, we were slightly concerned about the lighting in that space. She's a very dark fossil. Uh, that gallery is actually quite dark as well. Uh, and one of the things they did in, in their CAD modeling on the computer is that you can um, play around with lighting. So they could actually simulate what it would be like to put certain spotlights in certain positions, the way to optimize the lighting of the object to, to, to make her stand out more in that space. Uh, uh, in terms of the ease of access, um, now that she's up there, she's actually quite difficult to work on. Uh, we knew that to begin with. That's why we spent a lot of time uh, 3D scanning her before she went out on display. Um, so actually when we put her on the armature, this is the day before uh, her big launch, um, most of the stuff we could get onto the armature just standing on the plinth, but some of it required a cherry picker. Uh, and obviously now that she's up there, we don't really want to be uh, fiddling around with her anymore. So if we want to look at um, a particular bone, if we have a colleague from you know, a different institution or a different country that wants to study part of her, I ideally, they can now just work on the 3D models. I appreciate sometimes they'll need to actually come and look at the specimen. But um, speaking as a, a very recently cash-strapped PhD student, you can't afford to travel all around the world to every different institute to look at all the specimens you need. Uh, we can now collaborate via email, via Dropbox. You can just send the files. Uh, and that links into to data sharing as well. So uh, a lot of the publications that will be coming out about Sophie will involve these 3D models. Uh, and in order for people to, to validate our work, to go back and check and replicate it, we need to be sharing uh, our 3D models. So for a lot of the papers, our data will be available on, on things like Data Dryad. Uh, and also, what is going on? Uh, in terms of education, so these are some guys from the, from the education department here. Uh, they've managed to get their hands on one of the 3D prints of Sophie. Um, so we found it's actually really useful for things like Nature Lives and just for the education team roaming around, uh, around the specimen to actually engage with the public, with kids especially, to have these 3D prints. Uh, especially because uh, the plates are you know, the most iconic feature of the Stegosaurus. They're also the most terrifyingly fragile bits of her. Uh, your heart stops every time you've got to put them onto the armature. So in an ideal world, we'll never touch them ever again. Um, so it's great to have these 3D scans. So both for outreach and actually the, these ones are of such a high resolution, high quality that you could 3D print these and probably just work off of them. And then finally, uh, so everyone likes to have their plastic dinosaurs on their desk. I think most of us are guilty of it, uh, but sometimes it's nice to have slightly more accurate ones on our computer uh, to do some biomechanics on, uh, which is what I do. Um, so some of the techniques I used, uh, the obvious one is uh, micro CT. Uh, thank you very much to the guys down in the CT unit who did a sterling job. Um, so I won't kind of wax on too much about micro CT because I'm pretty much com like preaching to the converted, I fear. Uh, like everyone at the NHM seems to really appreciate um, the, the use of micro CT on their specimens. Um, needless to say, uh, reasons why we use micro CT is to look inside the brain cavity of Sophie, so we could look at things like the, the volume of her brain. Um, previously, stegosaurs have got a bit of a bad rap as having a, a very small brain. Uh, classic, it's the size of a walnut. Um, so we segmented out uh, the brain case uh, in this stegosaur, and it's actually a little bit bigger than that. It's something about the size of a small plum or a small satsuma or something like that. <laughs> So, you know, you've got to give her credit, it's not that bad. Um, and actually, we, so for the, the press office, wanted to put this in our kind of um, press releases and stuff, and they wanted to say what, exactly what fruit is that? I'd say it's a, it's a volume of, of X millimeters cubed, and they said, well, what kind of fruit is that? Uh, and funny enough, there's not much literature on it. I did a Google search, but there's not. Uh, so we actually went out at lunchtime to Waitrose and just bought a whole bunch of fruits and just dunked them in, in water. Uh, and then that's what I had for lunch as well. So that's how we know it's a plum. It's a Waitrose plum. <laughs> uh, 
Um, so uh, another one of the gadgets that we used was a surface laser scanner. Um, so this was um, kindly uh, provided by uh, a group at Prop Shop. And they're a company that work out of Pinewood Studios and they do mostly um, prop design and prop scanning. So these guys have been working on the new Star Wars movie. Um, they've laser scanned uh, every single person in the Star Wars movie, every extra, every costume, every bit of the set, um, partly to, to 3D print stuff. So when things break, they just print another one. Uh, and also for things like computer games design. So when they do the new Star Wars computer game, they've already got 3D models of everything that was in the movie. Uh, and the gadget that they use for this uh, is this surface laser scanner. It's a Roma absolute arm. Uh, and just to give you an idea of the kind of costings of this, uh, if you fancy one of these gadgets, uh, just the laser head on it is about 60 grand. Uh, the software license is another 10 grand, um, the arm that it's on is, is super expensive, well, tens of thousands. So this is a really high-end piece of kit. Um, the resolution on it is lovely, you're talking the same resolution as, as the CT scanner, but obviously you're limited that you're not getting any internal detail at all. This is just external surface morphology. Um, but it can do very large things, so they've scanned uh, James Bond's Aston Martin with it, for example. Um, and also, the nice thing is they're real experts in 3D printing as well. So these guys have just been taken over by Voxeljet, which is a, a German company that specializes in absolutely massive 3D printers. Um, and so they did stuff for Guardians of the Galaxy. Um, so in that picture there, in, in Chris Pratt's cockpit, they 3D printed everything in there. Um, so even the thing that looks like glass, that's not glass, that's 3D printed transparent plastic. So they, they just CAD model everything and just 3D print it out. Um, so uh, it's using that same scanner, that same printer, that we've done the touch objects in the gallery. So we've printed uh, Sophie's plate, uh, her skull and the tail spike, and it's using um, these kind of gadgets. Uh, so this is briefly, if this plays, um, oh god, no, I don't want audio. Box yeah. Can manufacture complex plastic hey, using a... You don't need the cheesy, cheesy uh, talking. Um, so basically, the way that some 3D printers work is they uh, extrude a molten plastic, and they basically smear it over a plate uh, and build up layer by layer. Uh, the ones that Voxeljet have uh, are uh, slightly nicer in that they actually lay down layers of a kind of a plastic powder, and then a kind of print head comes over the top and consolidates it with a, basically a kind of glue. Some of them blast the powder with a laser and sinter it together, but these guys use uh, more of a kind of a glue technique. Uh, so you can see here they've put a layer of, of powder across, and then that's a, a print head printing a kind of pattern in glue effectively, and you do this layer by layer, uh, and you're getting a resolution of something like 600 dots per inch, so pretty decent resolution, uh, and that can print one meter by half a meter by half a meter volume. Um, so this is some of the, the biggest 3D printers in the world. Uh, and what you get out at the end is effectively just a tray of plastic powder, and somewhere in there, if you scrape it out, you find your, your 3D printed object. So this is the same technique that Sophie's plates and her skull were done in. Uh, and then they, they bake that in the furnace as well, and you can cover it with other, other glues to make it tougher. Um, so those two techniques are fairly, um, fairly pricey uh, for, the, for the kit to start up with, and in terms of the, the learning curve for how to use them well, uh, it takes quite a bit of investment. Um, the other option is photogrammetry, and this is how we digitize a lot of Sophie's skeleton. Uh, and this is something that you can go home or go out to your specimens in your collection and you can do right now. All you need is a, an SLR camera, or not even that really, you can use your iPhone if you want, uh, and a free bit of software. Uh, so the way that photogrammetry works, hopefully you're not going to get cheesy audio here, um, you basically just take a whole bunch of photographs of your specimen of interest. So it could be a building in this case, it can be a mounted dinosaur in the gallery, it can be your cat at home if it stays still long enough. Uh, just lots of photos from lots of different angles and something well lit. Uh, and then the way it works is it just looks for, for features. Uh, so matching features identified either by um, different colours or very sudden changes in colours and it compares between photographs uh, and matches up uh, areas of interest. Uh, for some reason it stopped, but anyway, you get, you get a 3D model, something like that, this is on a large scale, so this is a fairly um, coarse point cloud, um, but this is the kind of stuff that I was doing. Uh, so this is one of Sophie's tailbones, uh, and I would take about 50 or 60 photographs of, of each of these bones, 
uh, using a tripod, SLR camera, somewhere reasonably well lit, quite a long exposure on it, so you've got a nice depth of field. Uh, and then using a free bit of software, which is Visual SFM for Windows, or you can uh, buy a copy of Photoscan, which is a little bit easier to use, and that's about 50 or 60 pounds, so kind of an educational license. Um, and you get the thing in the middle. So that is a point cloud, that's not a mesh, that's just points in space. And there's several million points there. And you can keep color as well. Uh, and from that, you can then mesh them into a, a solid object. You can even transfer color across to the mesh. And then they're good enough for, for 3D printing or for incorporating into to bigger models, whatever you wish. Or sharing them, turn them into a 3D PDF to send them to someone. Um, so this is another example. This is just our, our giant sloth. This was uh, using about 200 photographs. Uh, and that's one's quite tricky because it's quite difficult to get access all the way around. Um, so this is really at the limits of what photogrammetry can do. Uh, ways in which you could begin to improve this, we've been looking at um, quadrocopters. So you can put little GoPros, uh, even on selfie sticks. You've seen lots of people in the galleries now have got selfie sticks. Um, they're really good for this, or attach it to a quadrocopter if you're confident in flying it around the priceless objects and not crashing <laughs> into them, which, yeah, um, then that's one way of doing it. And people have used that for lots of kind of um, GIS mapping and things like that as well. Uh, and this is the end result. Um, this is almost entirely done by photogrammetry apart from the plates. So the plates are really tricky, very fragile. So that's where we use the, the more expensive uh, surface laser scanner on the arm for um, but the vast majority of that was photogrammetry, and it is, it's very labor-intensive, um, but it's free, which is nice. Um, so the kind of research that will be coming out of this now that we've got our 3D models, um, so one of the most basic things is we're just doing a, a redescription of Stegosaurus. So the go-to text still at the moment is Gilmore 1914, and it is um, the, as I say, go-to go text on Stegosaurus, and it's what we've been using when we've been looking back and describing Sophie, uh, and it's really um, just building upon this. It won't be replacing this, um, but um, doing the full redescription of Sophie, uh, photographing everything, every single bone, and lots of different views, and then also the 3D models, uh, and these will be published open access uh, and with the 3D PDF, so everyone can can get access and, and have a look at it. Uh, oh, body mass. So this is biomechanics. So this is what my background is in. Um, so one of the things that I'm interested in is looking at ways in which we can estimate body mass of extinct animals. Uh, this is mainly because uh, some of the more advanced modeling stuff that I do in, in simulating locomotion is very dependent upon having a decent, accurate estimate for body mass first. Uh, and classically, I mean, we know that the fossil record is very, very fragmentary. So most species that we know of are known from only a few bones. Uh, so most of the techniques we use for estimating body mass are, are based upon those isolated elements. So classically, it's femur circumference. So you would go away and go to a collection and you'd measure femur circumference in lots of modern animals, whichever's most appropriate for your data set, so mammals or birds or reptiles. Uh, and you would plot that against the body mass of, of the animal. So you get a, a predictive equation uh, using femur circumference to estimate body mass. And that's classically how it's been done, and that's probably how it will continue to be done because most fossils we know of are fragmentary. Um, however, there is a, an alternative option when we've got very complete specimens like Sophie. We can estimate body mass volumetrically, which means we create these 3D reconstructions, and then we can estimate the volume of the animal, and from that, get a body mass. Uh, so this isn't a new idea. This is from the 1960s, and this is actually a published journal article, uh, and they've constructed scale models of their dinosaurs, and they've literally padded them out with plasticine to look uh, realistic, as they believed you know, how the soft tissue contours should have looked. And then you literally, as I did with the plums to estimate Sophie's brain volume, uh, dunk them in water and look at the displacement to get a volume. And then people tend to just multiply that by uh, an estimate of tissue density, and you get a body mass for your animal. Um, that's fine. Uh, unfortunately, that's not, it's not very repeatable, uh, because it's very much a kind of an artistic impression of what you think the animal should look like. Um, but then moving on from that, uh, the kind of... The, predecessor to me in my life in Manchester is Carl Bates, and for his PhD, he was looking at basically digital equivalents of this. So laser scanning a dinosaur, this is Edmontosaurus, 
uh, and then in a CAD package, effectively just wrapping 3D shapes around your skeleton to get a volume. Um, so this is an improvement upon the plasticine in that um, then you can share these shapes in your supplementary material. People can check to see if they agree with you. Uh, but at the end of the day, you still, it's still very much an artist's impression of what you think it should look like. Uh, it's, it's subjective how you decide you know, how much soft tissue you should put uh, around their trunk, for example. How, how podgy should they be? We're not sure. Um, so then something I was looking at for, for my PhD was looking at an alternative technique, which is convex hulling. Um, so to explain a convex hull, imagine you've got, you've got a set of nails and you've hammered the nails into a plank of wood. Uh, and then you stretch an elastic band around that set of nails and then you let go. And the elastic band snaps to the outermost nails. So the polygon that's defined by the, that set of points is the convex hull of that point. And it's basically the minimum volume polygon you can get while still the edge is being convex. Um, now, if that's in 2D, imagine going to 3D. Here we've got a point cloud, set of points in space representing a human skull. Now, instead of elastic band, imagine you wrap a uh, rubber sheet around the whole object in 3D and let go, and then it snaps to the skull. So you get a minimum volume uh, for your skull. Uh, so now, in order to use this for, for body mass estimation, uh, we went to uh, Oxford Museum, and Oxford Museum's got this um, mammal gallery where they've got lots of articulated mammal skeletons, and they're going kind of like two by two, like they're going towards Noah's Ark at the end. Uh, and we took a LiDAR scanner and we scanned the, the whole gallery. So we've got 3D models of, of every single skeleton in that room. And then we basically carry out the same operation, fitting these minimum shrink wrap fits to all of those modern skeletons. Uh, and we've also got body mass for them. So then we have a, both a volume and a body mass for all of these animals. And then we use that in a predictive equation instead of just femur circumference. So our idea being that perhaps by including more information from the skeleton other than femur circumference, perhaps we will get a better estimate of body mass. Perhaps sometimes some animals have particularly chunky legs. Uh, moa, for example, have really, really robust legs, even compared to their overall body size. So perhaps by basing our mass estimates just on legs, perhaps we were skewing our results. So we thought that perhaps by doing this volumetric technique, we might get perhaps more accurate results. So this is something that we did to Sophie. Um, so here on A, C, and E, you can see basically a skinny Sophie, a medium Sophie, and a fat Sophie. Uh, so this is just carrying out a sensitivity analysis on how we reconstruct her. So when we re-articulate her both in, in, outside in the mount and it, on the computer, there is some uncertainty about how much, how much spacing do you put in between each individual vertebrae, we're not quite sure, or how much do you flare the rib cage out. If you've got kind of damaged ends of your ribs, for example, you're not quite sure uh, how, how barrel-chested she was, and that will really affect the volume of the animal. Uh, so we've done a, a skinny and a medium and a, and a fat version of Sophie. From that, you can estimate the, the minimum convex hull, and using our predictive equation, you can convert that to estimated body mass. Uh, and for Sophie, we're getting things like 1.7 tons, I believe. So that's uh, smaller than most elephants, but about the size of a rhino, which if you go and look at Sophie is actually reasonably accurate, we think. Uh, and the first kind of paper that will be coming out of this is basically comparing the traditional techniques based on femur circumference to our volumetric techniques as well. Uh, and the good news is that actually they're in broad agreement, which is nice, uh, especially if we correct for factors such as age. So Sophie is a young adult, so based on histology, uh, she hasn't quite finished growing, so we have to take that into account when we predict body mass, because we know that babies aren't just shrunken down versions of adults, you do change in bodily proportions as you grow. So once we account for that, we get agreement between our two techniques, which is reassuring for what we're doing. So why do I need body mass? Well. Um, I need body mass and I also need what are called segment inertial properties. So that means how is the mass distributed throughout the skeleton. And that's something that you just don't get if you just base a body mass estimate on, on just the leg bones alone. Um, now this is Sophie and she's been muscled up in a program called GateSim. And GateSim is something that we developed in Manchester. And from this we can effectively reconstruct how animals would have walked. Uh, so we've had some success in doing this with some sauropods, with Argentinosaurus. Uh, and most importantly, we've validated it with modern species as well. So we've got uh, humans and a 
ostrich and a horse, I think, in Gatesim, and they all, uh, this technique reasonably accurately predicts top running speed in those animals. Um, so what we've done here, we've based the, the muscles on, on a published myology by Susie Maidman, Imperial, and McPaul. Uh, and we basically, you define the origin of the muscle and then where it sits on the body, define some, some joints and how the muscles kind of wrap around those joints. Uh, and then we've got a model and then we use a, a technique called uh, evolutionary robotics. Uh, it's based on a, a kind of a genetic algorithm. Uh, the way in which it works, if we've got, say, 40 muscles, uh, I'll just randomly fire off all the 40 muscles in, in any old sequence. But then I'll do that a million different times in, in a random fashion. Uh, and we set some sort of success criteria, like how far she could walk forward in a given time period. Uh, and like 99 times out of 100, she will totally flip out and she will do a cartwheel backwards and a handstand and then fall over and it's a disaster. But in that random sequence, one time she might take a slight step forward before she falls over. And because we set the success criteria as distance traveled, then that we would say is the most successful genome. We then take that one and then mutate it slightly, randomize it a million times, run it again. The next time she'll take a slightly better step forward or then she might move her next foot forward. Uh, all of this has to be run on a supercomputer, so we use either N8 in the Northwest or uh, Archer supercomputer in Scotland. Um, and eventually, uh, over several months, they effectively learn to walk by themselves. Um, so we don't set any criteria about how long their stride should be. All we set is the, the original muscle properties uh, and then some sort of set success criteria. So we could also, instead of doing top speed, we could do to, in order to minimize energetic cost, for example. Um, so this is something that we're going to be pursuing with Sophie. Uh, we're really intrigued to know um, what kind of gait pattern she had, given those uh, very short forelimbs compared to the hind limbs. It's kind of unprecedented in modern animals, really, so it'll be intriguing to see uh, how she's doing that. Uh, and then bite force. Um, so this is something that is ongoing with a, a colleague uh, in Bristol called Stefan, and he is an expert in retro deformation, which means basically taking um, objects that are quite badly damaged or crushed and turning them into beautiful skull-like models that look shiny and you can attach muscles to. Uh, and what's really nice about Sophie is actually the skull is very complete. Uh, it's the best skull we've got of a stegosaur. Uh, and also it's, it's exploded apart. So all the bones weren't sutured together. Uh, they were scattered when we found her, which means that when she's been fossilized, she hasn't been too badly warped or deformed. Um, so now we can glue them back together effectively. This is all done from CT scans uh, done here. Uh, and then once we've got a nice undeformed um, model, uh, we do something very similar to what I just explained with the, with the postcranial stuff, but on the jaw as well. So we'll attach muscles to it, uh, and from that we can activate the muscles and estimate the kind of bite forces that she would have been generating. Um, that's particularly interesting in stegosaurs uh, because she's got just really weird teeth. Uh, if you have a look at them, they're, they're very small. Uh, and particularly the, the lower jaw here, you can perhaps see a little bit. The teeth seem to be pointing slightly inwards rather than upwards, uh, and it just looks like there would have been, been very little kind of occlusion between the top and bottom set of teeth. So she may not have been chewing at all, very minimal processing of her food. Um, and perhaps that's what the, the giant belly is for instead. You've seen how barrel-chested she is. Uh, perhaps she was fermenting her food in there. So anyway, that's something that we're, we're working on at the moment, is to, to reconstruct uh, what bite force, if any, she could have been generating. Uh, and with that, I shall leave it. Oops, leave it there. Um, I shall say many thank you to um, to Jeremy Herman, who is our lead donor, who made it possible to to purchase Sophie, and also to the whole team uh, that put Sophie together. So, uh, as well as the, just me and me and Paul doing the science, we've had a whole team of of engineers and 3D designers and media, everything putting it all together, which has been amazing. Uh, and also thank you to Stefan in Bristol and Susie Maiman and Imperial uh, for all their work. Uh, and I shall leave you with some of our mesh lab models now that they're up there, if I can spin them around. Uh, where is my cursor gone? I've lost it. There we go. Okay, so this is one of the CT scans of the brain case. Uh, and then if we take that away, oh yeah, there's the brain inside. So you can see the kind of size of her brain. It's not too bad, so it's the size of a plum apparently. Um, there we go. And then we can have a look at, uh, can you see down here? Let's get it over here. That's better. Leave you with a 3D model of, uh, of Sophie. Mm -hmm.
There we go. So this is the, the end result of all of our hard work. Uh, so there she is. Um, so this is her in her pose as she is now. Um, so this is the kind of thing that is made available on the public displays. Uh, it will be available in our supplementary material of all of our papers uh, and hopefully uh, widely distributed. Uh, so with that, I'll leave you there. Uh, if you've got any questions, um, I'm welcome to take some or over beer. That would be good. Um, thanks, Charlotte. Um, I'm just going to pass the mic to anyone who has a question. I think Pete, you is, um, the way they have the mouth open on the display now, yeah. is that exaggerated? Uh, I would imagine so. She does look somewhat gormless. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I mean, these, I mean, they are herbivores, right? Yes, so yeah. There's a good chance she wouldn't even use her mouth as a threatening, you know, it would be, be the tail that she would... Yeah, I think the tail would be doing most of the threatening, and the fact that she's got such intimidating plates as well. Um, yeah, I'm not quite sure about the mouth pose, but um, someone, when we got interviewed by Newsround for the launch, someone asked me why she had itchy resting face. <laughs> <laughs> On Newsround. <laughs> um, yes, no, I'm not sure that that's entirely accurate, who can say. <laughs> the other question is, just if you have any interesting anecdotes about the provenance and the process of getting it and how we acquired it. Yeah, like sure, I can go into... Stuff into a bit of detail. I think Paul's done a, a good uh, Nature Live talk, which mm -hmm. might be okay. on Tinternet. Um, I don't know if they're showing it, but he talk, Paul talks a lot about the, where she comes from. Um, but yeah, she was found in Wyoming, um, and she was, well, we found her at Arizona Fossil Fairs, where we bought her. She was uh, excavated and prepped out by a team from Switzerland. You, she, she had made it to a fair before you even knew of her existence? Um, yeah, I don't think we knew that she was there. Yeah, I mean, I think they were quite surprised. <laughs> <laughs> so, 